And welcome everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the use of CMR for goggular assessment and uh, okay. uh, just a bit of uh, disclosures. I will be talking very, very briefly about the use of gadolinium contrast for off-label use. And as, uh, as Dr. Kinonis and others have uh, roughly pointed out, in terms of valvular assessment, echocardiography still remains first line for uh, initial and serial evaluation of valvular heart disease. It can provide a lot of information, and, and as can be seen here, you can look at the chamber thickness, uh, chamber size, function, morphology, and also get uh, PA pressures through usually the TR jet. Of course, uh, ECHO does have some disadvantages. If I told you this was a 30-year-old with a congenital heart disease, you'd be hard-pressed to believe me. Um, there are some patients who unfortunately don't make the best acoustic windows, and those are usually um, intubated ICU patients, COPD patients, and ob obese patients. That's not to say CMR is any exception to that rule. Unfortunately, um, there, we are limited by bore size, but uh, not so much weight limit, but by how wide the patients are. So where does CMR actually uh, contribute in terms of the assessment of valvular heart disease? This is st straight from the uh, 2017 valvular regurgitation guidelines uh, by our very own Dr. Zogby et al. And uh, whereas we can see clear cases where the mitral regurgitation may be mild versus severe based on vena contracta, uh, based on p uh, side regurgitation volume calculations, there, are gray, uh, there is a large gray area in between where you may have data that are discordant. And so in terms of these uh, situations where the uh, clinical data or the, and the echocardiographic data may be discordant, uh, TE and CMR may play a role in, in offering additional information. And that brings me to the point of looking at a triad of information, looking at your patient, of course, in terms of his, uh, his or her history and physical exam, looking at your 2D echo parameters, and of course, looking at Doppler echocardi uh, echocardiography as well. When they're discordant, that's when uh, additional data from different modalities may be, uh, uh, may be beneficial. Now, in terms of the strengths of CMR, CMR allows us to uh, achieve a high, uh, high SNR and, and contrast to noise ratio uh, image quality, it allows us to get large field of view so we can see surrounding an anatomic structures as well. We can set infinite number of unlimited imaging planes and get highly accurate volumes and function measures. Um, and believe it or not, we can also, through the use of other techniques, get uh, um, accurate velocity and flow measures, and we can also check uh, viability. And, and of course, this is all um, uh, for a modality that's radiation-free. I'd like to talk first about uh, assessing ventricular volumes and function. In this case, one thing I want to emphasize is volumes and flows, we do not need contrast. So you can actually order a CMR without contrast for quantification assessment. So uh, although everyone thinks we need gadolinium for, for a lot of our techniques, for these particular uh, uh, um, uh, pieces of inform information, we don't. Uh, but in this case, we can actually get very accurate ventricular volumes and function uh, to the point where this has been validated in animals and uh, cadaver hearts and in, in vitro as well compared to FIX and ECHO. Um, and we are very highly re reproducible. We make no geometric assumptions about the heart when we do our quantifications. And as I said, since we can set infinite number of scan planes, we can align ourselves and, and see everything that we need to. The second piece of the uh, puzzle that we have, is, that we're able to add, is the uh, assessment of flow. Using a technique called phase contrast imaging, we can actually set a, a scan plane along the um, perpendicular um, at, um, direction of the flow and assess through plane flow. And uh, this, too, has also been uh, uh, strongly validated in, in various settings. Um, it's been validated against FIX and thermodilution, against Doppler as well. And by getting the flow information and integrating this over time, we can get the uh, volume of flow um, over a cardiac cycle. So combining these two, then we can begin to see different discrepancies between these and then begin trying to balance the books, uh, so to speak, to try to uh, uh, assess quantification of flow. Um, in terms of direct application to valvular lesions, um, aortic insufficiency is uh, one good example where, where this technique is directly applicable. So by, again, setting the uh, scan plane against a perpendicular direction of the flow, we can get the direct aortic regurgitant volume and calculate that it's 80 cc's in this case, and, like, and therefore a regurgitant fraction of 50%. We have various other methods besides the direct method where we can look at the um, flow, uh, flow volume through the LVOT and aorta and compare it to the PA net flow to also get the same information. Or in the absence of, the, of other valvular heart lesions, we can look at the difference between LV and RV stroke volumes as well. 
Now, what about mitral regurgitation? Well, it turns out by combining these two pieces of information, we can again get, uh, get, um, uh, get the amount of regurgitation volume going through the mitral valve, because whatever must be going, uh, whatever must be going through aortic, uh, aortic valve, and, and in this case, must, uh, that's not uh, accounted for in the LV stroke volume, must be going through the mitral regurgitation uh, orifice. And shown here on the left is uh, a technique whereby we uh, put all the uh, uh, short axis synase and get our LV and diastolic volumes and systolic volumes and then stroke volume. And here we get the aortic on the right side, the forward flow information of 71 cc's. And with the 137 and 71 cc's, we calculate here that this patient has 66 mLs or roughly about 48% regurgitant fraction. I won't belabor the point, but uh, we also are able to use uh, various other uh, flow measures and volume measures in combination to again get the information. And the thing I want to point out is then by accounting for the aortic regression in flow, we can also uh, account for uh, and get the uh, regression flow uh, even in the presence of AI. And this has also been well validated in uh, various uh, studies. Um, and this is here for your reference. Um, and of course, like I said, we are not limited uh, by, by um, the presence of AI. With uh, uh, Doppler echocardiography, the mitral forward flow is unfortunately contaminated by, uh, by the AI jet, and so that tends to lead to an underestimation of MR regression of volume. Whereas um, with AI present, we can still uh, carry out the computation with our, uh, more, with our more reproducible and accurate uh, volume measurements. This is just showing the same thing again, where we can get the regression volume even in the setting of significant AI. Okay. In terms of the serial assessment and reproducibility of regression of volume versus, uh, uh, for echo versus CMR, uh, CMR does uh, hold a marginal, um, um, a marginal uh, advantage. Um, as you can see here, the R value here is 0.99 compared to 0.88, uh, and 0.94 for mitral regurgitation uh, versus 0.9. Now I talked to you about how to look at the severity of the uh, recursion and volume. Of course, we can also add the uh, consequence of looking at the uh, uh, volume fraction and, uh, and chamber enlargement as well. I like to change gears a little and talk about the mechanism and also talk about looking at the viability as well. Shown here is a, a nice classic case of mitral valve prolapse. And let's see if this will play. And as you can see here, we can actually set a, a number of short axis stack. Um, long axis stacks, um, uh, mind you, through the uh, uh, coaptation zone of the mitral valve and look all along the uh, different parts uh, of the valve and see where the uh, prolapse is actually involving. And as you can see in this case, uh, it's mostly in the A2P2 region. And uh, as our uh, former graduate, uh, uh, Denai, has, has nicely shown in a recently published article, we are able to detect myocardial fibrosis as well, replacement fibrosis or scar tissue that has a predilection for lateral wall and mitral valve prolapse. And this is a potential area for uh, arrhythmogenic events um, that's being actively explored now. Now, in terms of using it to assess for chordae and uh, subvalvular apparatus, we do recognize we're a bit inferior compared to TE, uh, whereas we can uh, identify malcooptation and, and flail. When we uh, look for uh, chordae, uh, we do uh, show uh, only four out of 10 uh, confirmed flail cases in this study, whereas TE was able to identify all, all, all situations. In terms of uh, assessing viability in secondary MR, this is a case uh, where you can clearly see there's a thinning, but we can also confirm that there's uh, increased extent of uh, uh, replacement fibrosis or myocardial infarction in this region as well. And then in terms of looking at other mechanisms of leakage, uh, uh, mechanisms uh, related, related to mitral regurgitation, this is a nice case sent by, our, by another recent graduate of ours um, who joined, the, uh, joined our colleagues next door um, with multiple valve lesions. And if you look very closely in the top uh, right, you'll see that there's an area uh, opposite the LVOT, which looks like there, there's a, uh, an issue with the, uh, with, with the uh, surgical valve and uh, that's best demonstrated on a three chamber just below it, showing there's a bit of dehiscence. Um, he was not aware of this, and when we called, it led to a very fun conversation as to what to do next. Um, this has been put forward by uh, consensus experts for, for uh, uh, again, adding contribution for assessment of paravalvular leakage, uh, especially because CMR can um, add very accurate regression volume information. In terms of visualization of volumes and, and quantification in mitral clip, 
uh, as can be shown in this example here, MicroClip doesn't limit us at, uh, at all. So we can see the endocardial borders very well and do our tracings and get our flow measurements as well. Switching gears to aortic, uh, aortic stenosis, uh, as Dr. Kenosis um, nicely uh, put in his uh, last presentation, he, he showed that uh, there may be situations where the, aort where the aortic valve data from the from the Doppler echocardiography uh, may be discrepant. And in such situations, TEE, CMR, and even um, CAT might be beneficial to, to, to add, um, add to the data. And, and this is not an uncommon scenario where we get like an elderly gentleman who has uh, clearly, uh, cal uh, a clearly calcific AS going on into TDE echo, but the um, uh, Doppler data is discrepant. As Dr. Kunos put, uh, pointed out in his last talk, uh, this could be issues due to uh, Doppler alignment. And so uh, um, an echocardiographer should take the time to try to interrogate the valve as well, he, uh, as, well as he or she can. But where CMR can add an advantage to is that we can actually set infinite number of scan planes, like I said. And so our text note uh, to set scan planes that are perpendicular to the direction of flow, because the fl uh, flow may not necessarily be in line with the annular uh, and, and uh, the valve annulus um, as well. And by looking at where the aliasing stops, in this case, 425 um, centimeters per second, this is where our peak velocity uh, is, is considered and uh, used for, for our uh, various estimation of severity. This is just illustrating the same. We can see on the right, uh, rightmost panel, there's aliasing, whereas on the left, the aliasing stops at a 450. But where uh, CMR really shines is where it can actually look at the valve itself and add information on planimetry. So by looking at, um, looking at the valve and, and finding the point where the, uh, where, where, where the tip, uh, leaf tips occur and setting a scan plane there, and looking at the largest uh, opening area, we can actually measure an anatomic uh, valve area, in this case, 0 0.7 um, centimeters squared. And this has been validated along with uh, uh, peak velocities and uh, one study looking at continuity equation as being uh, valid as well. In terms of looking at mechanisms, CMR can actually look at the valve and uh, tell you whether or not it's quadricuspid, the very rare form, or more commonly, um, uh, bicuspid. We can also look at uh, surgical valves and get an idea uh, to some degree about the, uh, about the uh, function of that as well. We can also look at the aorta in terms of the, uh, for bicuspid valve cases because uh, work by our uh, uh, colleagues in Northwestern, we do 44 flow collaborations. They've demonstrated very nicely that there's a predilection to increase wall shear stress, and it's recognized that in the case of bicuspid aortic valves, uh, they have an associated aerotopathy that the surgeons will definitely want to know about when they go in and repair it. Um, and uh, we can also look at uh, subvalvular obstruction and interrogate it in great detail. So shown here is a very nice case where we uh, used anatomic valve area to prove the uh, um, no significant uh, valvular stenosis, but that uh, peak velocity did not occur above the valve, but at the LVOT at 3.5 meters per second. And last but not least, by similar fashion, we can look at uh, supervalvular obstructions as well and uh, identify uh, regions, in, in this case of Williams syndrome, uh, uh, where, where uh, aortic um, supervalvular stenosis may occur. So just to sum things up, where can CMR help? In the case of uh, uh, most valve lesions, we can help add information in terms of discrepancies between the various clinical data. We can help overcome suboptimal echo data. We can look at multiple valvular lesions. We can look at assessments of volume and function, and of course, valve morphology. For regurgitation, we can uh, examine paravalvular regurgitation, um, help, uh, help with quantification in the eccentric cases or multiple uh, regurgitation jets. And we can also add uh, um, value in terms of serial assessment of regurgitation volumes. For stenosis, we can also look at uh, peak velocities as well, I look at uh, area and velocity discrepancies, examine the thoracic aorta, and also look at uh, sub and supervalvular uh, obstructions as well. Thank you so much for your attention, and um, I'm open for any questions unless we need to move on. Thanks, Eric. We'll, we'll save the questions till the end of the session. Thanks.